So, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming again. I hope to entertain you this morning by continuing in what we have uh, discussed last, uh, yesterday. So, um, after I gave some insights into uh, what I think is needed in terms of uh, having benchmark configurations to look at and gave some examples on what you can measure in there, um, I will start this morning to give some more details and insights into how to measure important quantities. And uh, I will start with some discussions about flow field diagnostics and then continue with uh, scalar field diagnostics and we'll have a focus here primarily on thermometry. And those of you who are already working with, uh, let it be LDV or PIV or all these acronyms or CARS or so, for them it might be less interesting, but uh, I guess in this auditorium as well are people who have uh, not performed this uh, advanced diagnostics and may use these data very often in terms, for example, comparing to their own models. And I think it's very important whenever you use any data, you should have an idea how they have been generated and uh, that you are careful in believing what you're seeing. Yeah? So I want just to make sure or create some sensitivity uh, that all of these techniques, they have their limitations. They have as well uh, errors. The, they are limited in terms of accuracy and precision. And very often that is extremely difficult experimentally as well to obtain reliable numbers for those. And uh, that's why I think it's useful, even if you're working on the modeling side, uh, to have an insight, a better understanding on, uh, let's say, these diagnostic methods. defined and let's say the question is clearly clearly asked, um, then very often if you if you're in turbulent combustion you have to measure uh, flow fields. And that can be distinguished in the tasks that first you're looking for single point statistics, meaning that you're trying to obtain mean velocities of the, uh, the three components, the fluctuation levels and the rail stresses. After that um, it is very useful uh, to go beyond and, uh, for example, look into the turbulent structure by measuring strain dilatation and vorticity, which are derivatives, meaning that you need at least two points from which you can calculate these quantities. And as you will see, that is uh, most easily done by particle image velocimetry. Then, uh, it is very important uh, to have an idea about integral length and time scales coming out again from two-point correlations that can be done either by laser Doppler velocimetry or by particle image velocimetry. And then uh, maybe from the uh, order correlation uh, you would obtain from these measurements, uh, by Fourier transformation you might obtain power spectral densities, uh, which uh, give a more complete idea of the turbulent structure. But those um, measurements of these quantities uh, happen not very often. Sometimes you cannot do them, uh, like in uh, IC engines. Uh, you need statistically stationary conditions. And uh, although um, it is doable in, in many of these uh, turbulent flames, uh, it is not very done often because it's very expensive. And then after you have a basic understanding, let's say, from the turbulence field, uh, you should go and uh, try to have a detailed insight into the scalar field, meaning concentration values and temperatures. And again, you start um, with uh, single point statistics, means and fluctuations. Then very often we're interested in structural information, which is uh, more visualization. That is a relatively easy task uh, to visualize, for example, uh, the 2D uh, distribution of uh, certain radicals like OH radicals to see to get an idea at least where the flame is, where the flame brushes in terms of, let's say, premixed flames. Or you can try as well to extend that to three-dimensional diagnostics. That is something like a dream of an experimentalist that you as well, like in LAS, like in DNS, have a volumetric view of what's going on. And that is uh, under development uh, right now. If you would add time as well, then you would have something like a 4D diagnostics. Um, measuring scalar gradients can be as well very helpful. 
take example, for example, the uh, non-premix flames and have the scalar dissipation rate, which is uh, the squared gradient of the mixture fraction, uh, which is uh, very difficult to measure. But of course, if you uh, have finite rate chemistry effects, if turbulence somehow influences chemistry, that is something which is uh, really useful. Uh, or when you look into premix flames, you might be interested in flame structures that are changed in the regime diagram going up, where uh, turbulence is going and, and changes uh, the, the structure, make it different from a laminar flame structure. And uh, as well, very important uh, for more complex geometries, so that's not true. Even for simple geometries like jet flames, it can be very important that you have an idea about the temperature of your nozzle and the, and the wall where you have uh, the flame close by. Because um, this non adiabatici might be important really to understand um, the lift of height you might see even in a jet flame. Yeah? And so I think uh, that has been uh, ignored for quite some time, but uh, we have now developed techniques to uh, reliably measure even spectroscopically in complex environments, um, wall temperatures uh, of nozzles or enclosing walls. Yeah, inflow conditions and boundary conditions, I just repeat that. Uh, you should, either you know that if you have a simple geometry like a fully developed pipe flow, then it's okay. Um, however, very often you do not know them exactly because you have a complex geometry and then you have to measure it. And we have seen yesterday examples how difficult that might be and sometimes even impossible to really to measure it if uh, the optical excess is prohibitive. And finally, um, it might be interesting as well to look into uh, sequences or into temporal developments of things like uh, flashback. An example we have seen yesterday, other examples would be flame extinction uh, or cyclic variations in engines. And so unsteadiness is something as well that is becoming more and more important, the closer you get the flame operated at its stability limits. And so for that as well, uh, well, you need uh, certain diagnostics that allow to temporally resolve what's going on. So if you would um, easily explain what we are doing here in this kind of research, well, all of what we are using is coming from physics or physical chemistry. Yeah, all these methods have been uh, developed or uh, explored for very different reasons. For example, spectroscopy originally comes from the desire to measure uh, distances in molecules, for example. Yeah? That is now uh, something we just use and transfer it into engineering science um, because um, measuring with laser light means you can directly measure in situ. And that is uh, something which is, of course, much better than an extractive measurement. And um, yeah, in some cases, you can say you're really non-intrusive. You, uh, you do not disturb anything what you're uh, looking at. Uh, for example, in a technique like CARS, we talk about it later, coherent undisposed Raman spectroscopy, you create a signal and leave the molecule exactly in the same state from where you started. And then you're non-intrusive. In all other cases, uh, like in laser-induced fluorescence, for example, it is not really true that you're not intrusive. Maybe it's, you can ignore it, but uh, you, you start uh, your process and then you look for, for fluorescence and you end at a different uh, molecular level than you started from. And thereby, you have a leftover of energy in the molecule. It is a small fraction and we just say non-intrusive. But if you look carefully, it is not. If you go for um, particle-based velocimetry, where you add seeding particles, of course, you're intrusive because you have changed a single phase flow to a two phase flow. You must be careful about it and maybe change or reduce the particle density to the absolute minimum in order not to change the uh, extinction limit, for example, uh, drastically. We do have a high temporal resolution. That is a really a good thing about it uh, because with these um, uh, way uh, short pulse lasers working with the Q switch, it is very easy to obtain something like a few nanoseconds, and you will see that in a second. If you compare that to the time scales in these flames, that is much faster, such that we are looking really at, at frozen states. Whereas the spatial resolution, it is reasonable, I would say. Uh, very often at high Reynolds number, we cannot resolve all the structures, although, of course, it's much better than any intrusive sensors. Intrusive sensors typically have a extension of a millimeter or something like that or more. Uh, 
and we can go down maybe to something like 50 microns, 30 microns, that is something like a limit, uh, simply by the fact that we have to work with a working distance through lenses. We have a bunch of uh, techniques uh, available. Most of them, or maybe all of them, are in my lab available, uh, which is, I think, is well important uh, to have, because very often, in the beginning of a project, you do not know exactly what you need in the end, um, in the flow field, we are uh, still using laser Doppler velocimetry if we need accurate and precise information on points. A particle image velocimetry is much cheaper in the sense, it's much faster, and uh, depending on the flow, like the combustor yesterday, you would not have any chance to do that with LDV because of the problems with uh, fogging of the um, optical excess. We can do that into the regime of many kilohertz, just limited simply by lasers and cameras we have. Uh, you can do two component measurements in a plane, most uh, simple uh, device. You can extend that to three components stereoscopically, and you can do that even tomographically, uh, where you then have um, more than two cameras, typically four or five cameras looking into volume. Two phase flows, that is something which is um, still an open problem to have good diagnostics here, especially when you go for dense sprays. So most often what people use is me scattering for visualization of phase Doppler anemometry uh, that is used for velocimetry and for particle diameter measurements. And then we have a bunch of different spectroscopic techniques to measure concentrations and temperature. And that is what you, where you really have to use spectroscopy, although you see here me scattering in principle, mixing in some uh, um, geometries might be visualized as well uh, by me scattering. However, generally spoken, uh, for uh, quantitative measurements of uh, concentrations, temperatures, mixture fractions, uh, you need these spectroscopic methods. Absorption, fluorescence, Raman Rayleigh, or even nonlinear techniques like coherent anti-Stokes Raman spectroscopy and uh, phosphor thermometry that can be used uh, easily for surface temperature measurements as well. Currently, is developed for gas phase temperature measurements. I will not uh, talk about all of that in detail. It's more to give some uh, idea uh, about the pros and cons. And before I start because with the velocimetry, maybe some more details about the resolution. Well, when we work with lasers, the good thing about it is it's, they are coherent, and for that, they are very nicely focusable. If you do that, um, you can, in principle, create a small spot size and thereby have a probe volume, the measurement point, which is never a point, but always has some extension. The best you can get out of a laser is a so-called TM00 mode. That is something like a Gaussian distribution. Let's um, maybe make a short sketch. If uh, this is the extension, Z direction, for example, and your laser beam propagates in this direction, a TM00 mode would something look like, uh, something like that. Yeah? If you focus such a beam, um, as shown here with this lens, this is now the extension of your Gaussian beam, and uh, you have here uh, your measurement plane in the focal, or your measurement, uh, the probe volume, uh, displaced by uh, F, which is the um, focal length, uh, if you start here with parallel beams, then you can estimate the diameter or the radius of your probe um, by this simple formula that is uh, limited by uh, diffraction and uh, scales directly uh, with your um, uh, focus length, your wavelength, and inversely with the diameter of uh, the lens over here. And then this factor, uh, you can do the math. Uh, uh, that's not very difficult, uh, giving that number here. Uh, you can directly see that when you have to keep a certain working distance, you will have a certain uh, limited spatial resolution. And if you imagine uh, maybe uh, a turbulent flame with enclosure, you cannot go closer very often than 300 millimeters um, or 350 millimeters. And then um, the only choice, because the wavelength is as well typically fixed, the only choice you have is that you change the diameter of the laser at the lens. You can make it larger and thereby maybe uh, slightly minimize the radius or diameter of these probe volume. Uh, however, you're limited here as well. You can do that maybe um, 10 millimeters is standard. You might expand that probably to 20 millimeters. But after that, uh, you have as well to look for lenses uh, 
which are good enough uh, in this outer radius, such that um, you're somehow limited to something uh, at best in the order of, let's say, 50 microns. That's realistic. In practical, uh, in practice, very often you do not have this well-behaved TM00 mode, but you have a, a higher modes as well, and for that reason, uh, you fastly get worse and uh, maybe create diameters in the order of 200 microns or more. Yeah? So that is a limitation we have. Let's compare that to what we actually need. Um, if you uh, measure uh, by two-point correlations the spatial covariance, which is here uh, the uh, fluctuation value of the velocity component, component i and j, uh, which are here displaced from each other by uh, a certain uh, uh, length r, if you take this and normalize that, put it in, into this um, integral over here, uh, what you actually do is um, you have here now the, the uh, co spatial covariance curve, and you do uh, the integration gives you the area below it, and you do this for a certain location, you end up with the integral length scale. And then uh, this is very often in the flows we're looking at in the millimeter range. So that is not the problem. Um, you use this um, length scale and you assume homogeneous isotropic turbulence, which is m mostly not, not valid, but that's all what we can do, yeah? because we do not know how to do it differently. So if you presume that this is valid, uh, then with the turbulence kinetic energy, you can calculate the dissipation, and then uh, with the uh, kinematic viscosity, you can calculate the Kolmogorov length scale, which we think is the smallest length scale that you have to resolve before dissipation brings the small eddies into um, molecular movement. And if you uh, now go back maybe to that um, configuration we have discussed yesterday, this uh, swirling uh, nozzle over here with the central bluff body, and maybe go to a certain location, which is uh, just for example, 30 millimeters in top and 20 millimeters to the right, somewhere in the shear layer, I guess, and then um, perform these two-point correlations that we'll talk a bit later about, um, you can calculate here maybe for the axial velocity component. So this 1, 1 means uh, you're measuring at these two points the axial component, and you shift it now in, in axial direction. One is fixed, the other is transverse. And take uh, now from this uh, uh, spatial covariance curve, now the integral uh, on the left-hand side, or you transverse it uh, to the other direction. You see this is not symmetric. Uh, it is as well um, here for a different location as well. Very different, you see that. Uh, or you transverse in the radial direction, you keep it still with the axial velocity component, but shift the second probe volume in radial direction, you find as well different locations, and at different locations, different values. However, if you, let's say, take an average out of that for this uh, radius number 10,000, not very much, uh, you end up with a couple of millimeters. Yeah? If you now... Um, use, let's say, this uh, 6 to 10 millimeters and put it into the equations just shown before, you end up with something like estimated 50 microns. This is nothing more than an estimation, because uh, isotropy uh, might not be true in the shear layer where we have taken that data. But as I said, that's all what we can do. Um, and uh, for this lab-scale flame with only Reynolds number 10,000, you see uh, that uh, this spatial resolution we have seen here in the order of 50 microns matches the Kolmogorov scale. So here you can say, yeah, most probably we are resolving the smallest eddies. Uh, okay, if you, um, if you go uh, to um, higher Reynolds numbers, then the Kolmogorov scale would be smaller and you would not resolve anymore the smaller scales. And then, of course, you're, you're kind of, I would not say lost, but uh, you have to be careful. In, in the literature, very often, no one really cares. Yeah? You have maybe a measurement uh, with a certain resolution that has been published five years ago, and then the next guy is using uh, this data and compares his LAS to it, and you compare apple with pies. It's different because um, the filtering in the experiment typically, no, all the time, is a different filtering than in, in modeling. And uh, by that, uh, you apply different filtered quantities, you plot them above each other, and you say, okay, my model is, is reproducing what they have measured, great, that's it. But you have to be careful. Uh, it might be okay for mean values, 
And uh, for fluctuation values already, you have to look for sensitivities in the end, how um, the type of filter you apply is changing these quantities. And if there's a large sensitivity, you cannot simply spoken, then, then, then it's uh, uh, simply spoken wrong. Uh, but there, this is uh, ongoing. We not yet have something like a best practice how to do that. Now we're discussing that for 10 years or more, but in the end, uh, it is not really, uh, we haven't made too much progress, and still you would see uh, these quantities plotted on top of each other and saying matching good model is reproducing what you're doing in the measurements. But you have, I just want to say you have to be careful about it, okay? Let's have a look into the temporal resolution. Uh, here everything is much better, as I said. The way uh, these uh, typically quality switched lasers work produce simply a very short pulses, um, which means um, that uh, you can easily resolve everything in time. Maybe uh, one side note, we will talk later about that. This pulsed operation comes along not only with a high temporal resolution, but as well with a very high intensity. And therefore, lasers can be used to uh, make optics nonlinear. And one of the most prominent examples of nonlinear spectroscopy is coherent anti Stokes Raman spectroscopy. That is a tool that can be used uh, to reliably, accurately, and precisely measure temperatures in complex environments. Okay, coming back uh, to the uh, uh, temporal resolution, you do exactly the same as before. You calculate the integral time scale. The only difference is here that you take now the temporal autocovariance. So you can um, do that now at one single point. All what you do is in this calculation here, uh, you change uh, the second um, measurement in time, but at the same location. You normalize in the same way. You rely on the assumption of homogeneous isotropic turbulence and calculate now the Kolmogorov time scale. And if you do that for the same configuration as before, you see now here the uh, autocovariance, the temporal one. That's why we have no space, but a time coordinate over here. Uh, for different cases uh, with uh, Renaissance number 10,000, 40,000 non-reacting reacting conditions. And um, you take the integral and you end up with something in the order of, let's say, 100 microseconds. Yeah? If you have that, compare that to the 10 nanoseconds you have uh, in, uh, the, um, uh, from the lasers. If you perform, for example, um, any measurements of, of flame fronts or whatever, uh, then you find that the temporal resolution is actually not a problem. That can be resolved with most of the techniques. OK, um, maybe a side note as well. Um, by experience and as well by, by the fact that you can uh, discretize better in time than in space. Uh, if you're interested in power spectral densities, it is better to do that in the time domain than in the space domain. Yeah, and uh, because because uh, as I said, the, the temporal discretization of this uh, covariance curve is much better than in space, and uh, that is uh, giving reliable uh, power spectral densities if you have uh, sufficient uh, uh, data taken. Yeah? You cannot do this for uh, maybe uh, 500 samples or something like that. You need uh, many samples to do it accurately. Question. Yes? The Taylor's hypothesis should be valid for transformation. Yes, yes. So it's valid for most of the flow? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, well, for sure is it's valid for, for jet uh, flows. Uh, Already for swirl flows, I've, uh, I remember to, to read something about a modified Taylor hypothesis that is adapting for swirls. Um, well, it is, it is difficult to prove because you would have to measure both and see whether the transformation through the mean velocity is valid or not. Um, difficult to answer. Generally, I would say be careful, yeah? Unless you have uh, convinced yourself by measurements. If it's a simple flow, for sure. And if you don't have uh, the opportunity, of course, it's a good assumption to start with. It might be not completely true, but it might be OK in certain limits. Uh, however, you should make a statement about it that you assume it. And under the assumption of uh, this hypothesis, you end up with the results you're showing. Then I would say everything is OK. You have to clearly state it. Yeah. OK. Let's have a look into the spatial uh, 
into uh, measurements uh, more than point measurements, into um, going up to three spatial dimensions. So we started, of course, with point measurements, me meaning a point is always with a limited extension. Of course, you can do uh, 1D measurements if you now measure along a laser uh, focus. Uh, you can extend that to 2D if you uh, use cylindrical lenses or telescopes to create something like a light sheet, that is what we call, which can be uh, something like extended by a couple of millimeters, maybe up to 20, 30, 40 millimeters. And the thickness typically is the order limited of uh, minimum 100 microns, very often more than that. And you can as well extend that to quality 3D measurements uh, by uh, having multiple laser light sheets parallel to each other. Yeah? Either you have different lasers and uh, take that uh, information really from different uh, laser sources, or you might scan a laser across. And that is something uh, which is as well under development. I'll show you a bit old-fashioned data. We have uh, nowadays better than that. Uh, the idea is, um, to have, as visualized in this graph, uh, a volumetric idea, quasi 3D, multiple 2D planes, by having light sheets parallel to each other. And I just visualize you the idea, and that's why I take this uh, rather old experiment, uh, because it's based on the design we have uh, discussed already. Uh, here now, the bluff body does have a, uh, a tube from which you can uh, send out a jet in the uh, surrounding swirl. And uh, this jet is seeded. There's no reaction, no combustion, no flame. Uh, we just have seeding particles. Let's say this was oil droplets uh, that are now uh, dispersing in the field of a uh, rotating flow surrounding this uh, central jet. OK. And of course, what you can do is, for example, just to visualize uh, what's happening in this, in this mixing experiment by changing the swirl, uh, seeding density, and Reynolds number. Um, the scan rate here, uh, it was done in the following way. Maybe I could show it. Here is the, um, the sketch of the setup. Here's a high-speed laser that is used just to excite me scattering. You create something like a, a light sheet. You send it uh, through a scanning mirror. It's a very simple device, a galvo mirror that is turning back and forth. Uh, you have here a cylindrical lens to create a focus somewhere here. And then you image uh, the me scattering from these different planes that come one after the other, it's not simultaneously, um, onto the CMOS camera. The CMOS camera needs to be equipped now with a lens system giving a sufficient depth of field because um, you want to have a focused image in all of these places. And which means you have to uh, uh, bring down your aperture significantly. Yeah? So you're limited uh, because of the light uh, if you have the lens closed more and more to get, to get a larger depth of field is a certain limitation. However, if you do that, um, you can uh, now see what is, what is happening if you have no swirl to the left. Uh, what is visualized uh, after some uh, post-processing is uh, the, uh, the jet surface given by the particles. And that looks like, uh, like a simulation, you can say. This is now from different perspectives. And now you can, because it's temporally resolved as well, you can see as well its temporal evolution. If you now increase the swirl, uh, swirl number, I'm not sure, I think it was around one, you see more uh, mixing going on, more complex structures already, smaller structures, and you can temporally resolve that. For whatever reason, it disappears here. And uh, for a swirl number of two, uh, the structures are even smaller. You have uh, more rapid mixing as expected. Um, and uh, yeah, well, as well, the temporal resolution. Good. The, the problem here is you, you're limited because um, in this out of plane direction, because uh, you have only a limited number of planes available. In that case, I think we have had something like uh, 60 planes from which we reconstructed the out of plane direction. Um, and uh, this was done in two milliseconds. So that is not really fast. And that is the problem of this approach, that you need really fast lasers, and you need really fast scanners. Yeah? And this scanner, this Galvo scanner, is um, with 2.5 kilohertz not fast enough. And so for that reason, we developed um, a system of an uh, octagon rotating uh, to increase that up to 10 kilohertz. But still, that is a, a severe limitation. So um, if you want to go for investigation of high Reynolds number flows, uh, 
uh, and uh, have here quasi instantaneously the volumetric information, you come very fastly to an end. Yeah? Okay. Let's have a now, unless you have questions, please interrupt me if you have any questions about what I'm talking. Yes, please. Yes. So, is there any other method to uh, increase the depth of field? So, if I have more than that, what are the other Maybe you, two, you use two cameras from two opposite sides. No, not really. I think uh, that is that is a limitation you have. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the distance here, uh, I'm not remembering exactly. Um, that, that was in the order of uh, half a millimeter, half a millimeter, a millimeter, no less than a millimeter. It must have been half a millimeter in the order of, yeah. This is interpolated uh, using commercial program, TechPlot. It was, uh, you can do better for sure, yeah. Uh, that is just for, for a start, yeah. Okay. Now let's have a look into uh, how you measure flow fields. First of all, I would like to distinguish two methods. One is based on spectroscopy using the Doppler shift. That is hardly being used, but I just want to show that it's possible doing it by spectroscopy. Mostly velocities are me measured based on particles. The movement of particles, um, either based on the Doppler shift, uh, based on me scattering, which is used in laser Doppler velocimetry, or um, you have sequential poses uh, of the particle images and then relate them to each other, which is called particle image velocimetry. Briefly, I would like uh, to mention the Doppler shift of the absorption or emission line. So the idea is very simple. If you imagine you have a laser coming from the left to the right and you have a molecule, not a particle, a molecule crossing that laser at this location, uh, of course, the projection of the trajectory here uh, given by the velocity and the cosine of this uh, angle over here, uh, giving uh, this uh, line here, um, that causes a Doppler shift either in emission or absorption, which can be taken from textbooks. The Doppler shift is, is simply proportionally to this projected velocity. The wavelength uh, is given by the laser, so typically you can't do anything about it, uh, such that uh, the task is that you measure if you have, for example, here, uh, uh, an absorption line for a static sample like this, you would see for a moving sample with a, with a preferred direction, uh, you would see that this is shifted because of the Doppler shift. And all what you have to do is maybe take a feature like this, this uh, intensity maximum and see by far it has been shifted. Uh, that can be done when you have the opportunity, for example, to scan a laser across the absorption lines uh, in, the, in this region. Of course, that would take time. So you get something like a mean velocity, but you do not have to add any particles. So that is, uh, in that sense, very beneficial, but uh, uh, you need as well a high uh, resolution, uh, high spectral resolution in order to be able to distinguish the, these two peaks. And uh, for that reason, because of the limitations we have there, to my own experience, you can say maybe you can measure velocities faster than 30 meters per second, yeah? um, which means uh, for uh, high Mach number flows, for example, that might be really a good, good thing to do. For uh, low Mach number flows, uh, if you're interested in a couple of meters per second to be measured precisely, you cannot use that. Okay, so that's, that's one option, uh, although uh, not used very often. The other option is, as I said, you, you use particles. You have your gaseous flow, you put in seeding particles, and you take advantage of me scattering. And me scattering is something that, that everyone knows, at least in northern countries, when you're driving and during night and you have fog, you have your lights on, uh, and then your, your headlights, uh, you get all the light back in your face and you don't see anything. That is uh, me scattering from particles in the order of, um, uh, me scattering in the order of um, uh, when the wavelength uh, is in the order of the diameter of the particles. When we have visible light, meaning that we're in the order of, uh, let's say, a micron, then the me-scattering domain is for micron-sized particles. 
If you have smaller particles, you're in the Rayleigh uh, regime. If you have larger particles, you're in the geometrical regime. However, in our case, uh, we are uh, using micron-sized particles, as will be clear in a second, because you uh, want to avoid any slip between the particles and the gas. The idea is the particles that you measure follow the uh, gas flow ideally. More facts about me scattering, it's shown here schematically what happens if a light ray hits a spherical particle, then you have reflection, first order refraction, <coughs> second order, third order refraction, and so on are not shown. If you take, for example, a glass bead, one micrometer in diameter, and um, look here for uh, uh, the scattering intensity versus the scattering angle, you find a strong dependency in which direction you're looking. You might have more or less light. Uh, in some regions, uh, the uh, reflection and first order refraction are at a similar magnitude. And in other angles, they are, they are very different, by orders of magnitude different. However, that is something important for phase Doppler anemometry, for simple me scattering, for laser Doppler, and for PIV, it's not important. We just take the fact you get a strong signal, let it be from reflection or refraction, that is used to visualize where a particle actually is. You, okay. The particle that is seeded to the flow should follow the flow ideally in a perfect manner. And so um, for that reason, you want to minimize the slip. The slip velocity is simply the velocity, the normalized velocity difference between the fluid velocity and the particle velocity. And the requirement that should be fulfilled is, let's say, the slip should be not larger than 1%. Okay? If you um, take then this um, uh, as a cutoff, you can calculate a frequency to which the particles can follow at best. And you see here the slip is in this formula. Let's take uh, this is 0.01. And then you find here as well the density of the fluid um, is important. The density of the particle is important. We come to that in a second. And uh, the particle response time, where uh, not only the, uh, again, the uh, density goes in, but as well the diameter. So you directly can see from this simple equation, if you have a high or a large diameter, then the cutoff frequency will go down. And the cutoff frequency should be as high as possible because it is a measure of the velocity fluctuation, yeah? And the particle should follow, ideally, this velocity fluctuation. So uh, already from that, you can learn uh, the particle should be as small as possible. But that is a trade-off. The smaller the particle, the less the mean scattering intensity. And so you have to fulfill a certain limit to still uh, have significant uh, or sufficient signal-to-noise ratio. And for that, uh, you cannot make it uh, as small as you wish to have an ideal behavior in the flow. Moreover, uh, that holds true not only uh, for combustion applications, but as well for aer aerodynamics. Special for combustion applications is that you need particles which are chemically inert and which have a melting point uh, above the flame temperatures. And that causes, in practice, a huge problem. So uh, having a reliable seeding is something uh, where a lot of, let's say, uh, yeah, experience goes in, and every lab does it differently. And there is no best way off to do it. I think uh, that really depends on, on, on so many things that it's uh, hard to tell what is best. However, uh, there are some materials that, have, that are quite popular in use in combustion applications, like magnesium oxide, zirconium silicate, titanium oxide, and so on. You see here the density of these uh, uh, materials is rather high. And because of that, they are limited in their use or in limited in how well they follow the flow. However, the melting point, for example, magnesium oxide seems to be high enough that you have no problems with, with any melting. If you now um, calculate the cutoff frequency, taking magnesium oxide as an example, uh, with a slip below 1%, well, if you, for example, take a 2 micron sized particle, then your cutoff frequency at low temperatures, maybe prior to your flame, is in the order of uh, 700 hertz. That's not very good. So here is exactly what I want to, to make you aware of. If you have uh, here uh, an experiment, and if it's not really clearly stated what, what kind of particle size you have, and maybe you have to assume two microns is something, or even larger, 
then the velocity fluctuation are biased because you have a low pass filter characteristics. Yeah? And 700 hertz for a turbulent flow is not very much. Yeah? It is getting better if you have smaller particles, 0.5 microns, but already here it is uh, difficult to guarantee that in your flow are really these small particles because they may have clusters. If you have a humid air going through, particle clustering might make them larger, and you directly end up in a, in a very sensitive way with a uh, worsened uh, cutoff frequency. It is getting better if you go to high temperatures because of viscosity of the fluid. Yeah, that's the only reason. Where here, you can go, even with the large particles, you can uh, uh, go beyond 10 kilohertz in your temporal resolution without being biased. Yeah? But maybe that is not so clear uh, or very often ignored that uh, this low pass filter characteristics is a, is a severe limitation. All right. I show you now one example of how you could do it, uh, although that is only one out of many. Um, one possibility to get the particles into the flow is uh, having a device like this, where you have here the flow to be seeded. Uh, you have here a tank where you store your dried particles. Um, and then you have here for uh, a rotating mesh and a brush. And by that, you bring in the particles uh, um, into the flow, uh, as, as schematically shown over here. Um, by that, you can think that this brush and this uh, mesh, by this action, you, you destroy the smallest, uh, or you destroy any clusters of particles. There's at least one possibility. It's maybe not the best. I can't really tell what is the best. Right now, we are using... Uh, cyclone bed seeders where you have uh, a flow, uh, a fluidized bed from which you then uh, have particles escaping through the top and where you destroy the uh, particle clusters by a critical nozzle. However, I think that is something like a black art. How to make the best seeding is difficult to answer. Okay. Let's have a look into how laser Doppler velocimetry actually works. That's the first technique. Um, you have here two lasers uh, coming typically from an argon ion laser or nowadays as well from uh, diet from the solid state lasers. They have the same polarization, these two beams, and they are crossed in a certain angle such that you have here uh, interference pattern. And this is a simple view on how to explain it. Uh, and if now particles go through this measurement volume, it's extended. So maybe the diameter is in the order of, let's say, 50 microns depending on the angle and the lens to focus the length in this direction might be several hundred microns uh, up to a millimeter. And if now a particle is cross, you see the me scattering on and off, on and off, as they cross uh, constructive or destructive interference patterns. And if you now measure uh, the temporal distance here uh, between uh, these uh, me scattering strong, weak, strong, uh, and divide, uh, divide that, uh, or take, take, take here as well the separation uh, between the interference stripes, which you can calculate from the wavelength and the crossing angle, you can directly trace it back to the definition of the velocity. So that can be done, but you measure, of course, only one velocity component in this experiment. Instantaneously in the sense that um, typically you estimate uh, a mean delta t from this whole burst that is called a burst, and uh, depending on the velocity you have, the temporal resolution of your measurement is, let's say, in the microsecond regime. With that, um, uh, uh, you have a certain limitation, again, in space and time. And it might happen that you have acceleration in between, that a particle has a different velocity here than here. If you have that and uh, you're, you don't care about it, take a commercial product to calculate delta t. And from that, uh, the velocity, you get an average velocity. Yeah? But you might have a look at this burst beforehand in an oscilloscope and see whether something goes wrong or not, at least at average. There's one problem now, because if you have a particle coming from top or bottom, as shown here, uh, you would have the same frequency. Yeah? If you, if you uh, visualize that in this frequency over velocity range, positive velocities, negative velocities, uh, of course, the frequency sh uh, that, that is, is being seen from your oscilloscope or your data acquisition unit would be the same uh, for the particles having the same modulus of velocity but different directions. And so now the trick, the simple trick is you do not, you do not work with a 
a fixed interference pattern, but you create an interference pattern which itself is moving, and maybe moving in uh, this upwards direction. If these stripes are not standing still, but are moving, then the velocity um, direction is now um, uh, decoded in this following way. Uh, assume that you have a particle which is standing still, yeah? then the interference pattern is moving across it, and this gives rise to a certain frequency in this burst. Meaning, zero velocity does have a certain fixed frequency, which is simply the movement of the interference stripes. And if you now have a velocity um, of this particle Vp here coming from top, uh, it's running against the interference stripes, having a higher frequency. If the uh, particle with the same velocity Vp coming from, from below, it runs behind the interference stripes and has a lower frequency. And by that, you have now uh, resolved the direction as well, within a certain uh, limit. So depending on the velocity of the moving stripes, you have the smallest negative velocity you can measure. And that is uh, something you have to uh, take care of. Um, depending on the flow, you might have to change the velocity of these inter interference stripes. Of course, the question is, how do you make this uh, movement of interference stripes? Uh, we come to that in a second. I just want to visualize first uh, what is going on without any shift. Uh, in this visualization, you see uh, two laser beams, plane waves, Gaussian profiles, coming from the left. They interfere, and you see nicely here areas in the, in the focal region where uh, the wave fronts now go horizontal. Yeah? You have here this uh, dark in between. These are the uh, destructive interferences in between the uh, constructive interferences. And if you now have these particles, same velocity coming from top and bottom, Look at the, these uh, bursts. If you see the frequency of these bursts, they're identical. So you cannot resolve the direction. Differently, uh, it is here to the right-hand side. Maybe I have to go back. Um, now the lasers come from the left. They have slightly different frequencies, which you can't see by eye. But if you follow uh, here, the uh, destructive interference stripes, they move in, in space. Yeah? Because uh, the wavelength of these two lasers is slightly different. And now uh, those two particles, having the same velocity but different directions, they, of course, therefore have different frequencies in the burst. And that is uh, the simple trick that is, that is used. The question is how to do that. Uh, I will not go into detail, uh, just to mention it. You, typically, you start from a CW laser. and then, uh, it, it used to be an argon ion laser. Uh, and still you can have that. Nowadays, people prefer to have, instead of gas lasers, solid-state lasers. And uh, what you do is you split this laser into two legs, and one of the legs is going through a so-called Bragg cell. Just, yeah? Yes. 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 This, this year. Oh, this year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is a... Uh, uh, this is just an animation here. Uh, it's maybe not, not that correct that you have here negative values because you can go to zero only. If you, this is just how you handle the signal. If you take the mean signal and take their slopes through, then you can then you can make the signal looking symmetric like here. It is it is uh, more correct to, to view it like that because if you have a particle uh, crossing the uh, destructive interference stripes, you have no signal. Ideally zero, practically not zero. So this is more correct than the other animation. Well, well observed. Yes. This. So you you have a shift in the laser beams and you get different bursts for a particle going up and down. Yes. But with different bursts, how you can tell that uh, I can infer that they are having different velocities, but how can I tell the direction whether it is going up or down? Well, you you are getting a free. Uh, maybe this frequency, and then uh, you look uh, because you have this this uh, this curve for your detection system, and uh, with that you go to the velocity which is negative and gives you a certain a certain magnitude. Uh, for frequencies from zero, uh, um, sorry, from from zero to in, not infinity but to a certain limit, you have uh, the possibility to measure from a, a negative value 
uh, which is limited in its magnitude to positive values, which is limited by the maximum frequency you can resolve. And, and from, from that diagram, you can directly see uh, it, it is, it is uh, a direct uh, link between one frequency and velocity, direction, and magnitude. Okay? Yes? The spatial resolution, you mean the overlap region. The overlap region uh, here, you mean, you mean this expansion. That is uh, depending on how strongly you focus. Let's say you have 400 millimeter focal length. Then you have, with the wavelengths we are using, if you take an argon ion laser, around 500 nanometers. Uh, this is maybe in the order of 60, 70, 80 microns in this direction. The same would hold true in this direction, yeah, because that is symmetric. And this direction is maybe in the order of, let's say, a millimeter. Yeah, you can try. Pardon me? Uh, the many particles cross, so there will be overlap of the most. Yes, you have to be careful with that. If you have uh, many particles, uh, uh, let's say more than one uh, per time in this in this region over there, then you then you have problems because then your burst wouldn't look like clean like that, but overlaid patterns, and uh, that would give uh, you a, a problem. Uh, and those samples are not we call it validated, and th those are rejected because you can't find a clear pattern, and uh, that is something you have to fix. Uh, the validation rate should be in the order of more than ninety percent. So you have to lower the particle density to fulfill that. Okay? Yes? So will that delta be measured between the two, any two peaks will be constant in the miscasting intensity? Say it again, it's assumed to be constant. Delta yes. That is assumed if you uh, if you just take as it is. Yes, that is true. That that is not needed to be fulfilled. As I said, if you have let's say an acceleration from here to here, then the delta t would change. Uh, in a commercial product uh, that might end up with uh, um, a, an average velocity across this uh, length. Yeah, but of course, if you would analyze the burst on yourself. Yeah, take every burst, then you, in principle, can deduce the acceleration from it. People have done that. But this is not available commercially. Yeah, you have to do it on your own. Uh, in the commercial products, maybe if we're starting from a certain threshold, let's say data are taken only if you have sufficient signal to noise, maybe if you have surpassed a threshold value of that, then you would take the burst information only from this inner part, and then you would get an average velocity out of that. Yes? Have a signal and not yeah, well, by the, by, by the fact, you're looking at the bursts, that most of the bursts at the oscilloscope look clean like that. Yeah? And uh, in this, pro, uh, um, if you're, for example, there are not so many companies uh, selling that. Yes. Yeah, but but uh, uh, there in the, in the data analysis as well, uh, samples are only validated if you have this sufficient clean signal. And otherwise, they are rejected. And thereby, in practice, your validation rate goes down. And if you have a low validation rate, you shouldn't trust it. And then uh, what you do is you reduce your seeding. Validation rate hopefully goes up if you're well aligned. And um, you're fine if you have more than 90, 95% validation. Yeah? But that is, that is trial and error. And there is no clear, um, well, that is something like an experience. And very often, people from modeling just trust us experimentalists. You shouldn't do that. You know, uh, no, honestly, I know, I know you have a lot of knobs to turn at as well, but experimentalists, they turn knobs as well, very often, severely and strongly. And if this is not clearly stated in the paper, be careful. And uh, yeah, well, I shouldn't say that maybe, but, but um, I think uh, that these, these uh, publications and experiments, they should be much more thorough in stating how they have done things. And that is something you can't publish, because if you do that, then it, it's the, the reviewers say in a long article, all these details are not needed. But I, I'm, I'm strongly against that, that opinion. You should state that, and if you put, put it in an appendix, OK. But at some stage, people, an, an experiment should be repeatable anywhere in the world. And for that, you have to clearly define how you have done that. And that is some, for, for whatever reason, is getting less and less that uh, these uh, thorough experiments are, uh, are getting more and more seldom. However, any more questions? Yes, please. Do we need to report those negative velocities? Say it again. The negative velocities are those. Do we, not, do we need to report those? In, uh, Which velocities? 
Uh, the, the velocities of that is what you want to measure. These are the, the particle velocities which are decoding the gas velocities. That is what we're after to measure. Yeah? Of course, you have to make a statement as well about uh, the measurement range. Either you take the minimum velocity or you give uh, the, the value which, with which uh, the velocity, uh, the interference stripe is moving, which is typically done uh, in the sense that you give the uh, minimal velocity you're, you're able to take. I'm not sure whether I answered your question. Uh, do we need to actually report those negative velocities in our results? You have, well, it is about measuring gas velocity. Uh, like if we compare first and second graph, you have decreased the negative velocity, is it? I didn't, I didn't get your question. Maybe, maybe afterwards? Maybe? Yeah, we clear this after, afterwards, yeah? Uh, the temporal resolution that you have discussed earlier, is it because of the temporal resolution that you have discussed earlier? Is it because of the temporal resolution that you have discussed earlier? So, it is limited by the... Oh, stop. What do you mean by temporal resolution? You mean uh, what time it takes from one measurement to the next? That is uh, simply the appearance time of the, of the particles. That is uh, arbitrary to a certain extent. Or the other definition of a measurement time would be how long does it take to, to, me to measure the burst? Yeah, and, and that is given... It depends on the velocity of the crossing, yeah, which is in the microsecond range, typically. Okay? But the repetition rate is something which is given by the flow itself, depending on your seeding density. Yeah? So, uh, no, it's difficult, because if you want to go for high frequencies, uh, the events of having more than one particle in the volume is getting more probable. And so, in practice, going beyond, let's say, something like 5 kilohertz, critical. <laughs> yeah? It's better to stay maybe with 100 hertz, yeah? in average. Okay. So, uh, for the particle size, for the particle selection, you mentioned that the slip to be less than one percent. Yes. So, going by the formula, how do you calculate the velocity of the flow and the particles? To get rid of the velocity of the flow and the formula for the slip. Yeah. Here. Yes. Sir. So we have U F and U P. How do you estimate those? How to estimate that? Um, well. This, this number is something you preset. You say it should be, let's say, uh, below 0.01. Take 0.01. And then uh, with, I, 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 uh, with this derivation I don't have in mind, but you can look this up in literature, you can calculate the cutoff frequency. And here, you just put in the number you select, 0.01. And with these numbers and the densities um, and the diameter and viscosity, you're calculating the cutoff frequency. So you set this value to the number you wish. Okay. Yes. There are multiple reflections from the Multiple reflections can happen, uh, but uh, in LDV this is not very probable because you have a low seeding density. If you go for PLV, that might cause, uh, if you have, a, for example, a large flow, then that might happen and might uh, blur as well your, your particle images. Whereas in, in PIV it's not, so, it's not so critical. All right. Um, I stopped, I think, here. Uh, the way you now create the second wavelength out of the same laser is by having a so-called Bragg cell. And in this Bragg cell, you have a piezo-driven actuator that is maybe operating at 40 megahertz or something like that. And this actuator is causing a, an, an acoustic wave. And this acoustic wave is coupling with the light wave and thereby shifting it by the amount in first order uh, of 40 megahertz. And that is something so small in the, you, you couldn't see it, even with the best spectrometer, resolving 40 megahertz would be very difficult. However, it's sufficient that you have a slightly different wavelength. And by overlaying them, you have then the movement of the interference stripes. So that is done by a crystal uh, where you have this piezo actuator mounted to, uh, and that is a reliable, um, yeah, well, way to manipulate uh, these uh, uh, second wavelengths. And to create now uh, more than or measure more than one component of the load velocity is that you simply take different colors and different directions of the lasers. You create one interference pattern like this. These are now constructive interference stripes. You take another color, you make the next stripe pattern perpendicular to that, and maybe a third one like this. Shown is here only what typically is done, uh, only two component uh, laser Doppler velocimetry, where you have, for example, uh, they are shown in different colors now, but 
green and blue light from argon ion laser. And that is why people still like argon ion lasers. They provide different colors simultaneously. And so you can take one laser, you split the colors off uh, of this laser beam, and you form them uh, to pairs. And each of that pair, one of that is at least um, disturbed by this Bragg cell to create this moving interference pattern. And that is commercialized, uh, not very many companies uh, um, that provide it. Uh, but you have here uh, the laser, you create pairs of wavelengths um, from an argon ion laser that would be 514 nanometers, that is in the green, 488 nanometers in the blue, 476 nanometers if you want to go for the third component, which would be in the violet. And that is typically then fiber coupled. You have then here ascending optics where you have then this pairs. Here's only shown in the cut one pair. And then uh, typically as well, you can change the lens. You can change the, the separation between the two beams and thereby in certain limits, you can uh, manipulate the extension of your probe volume. Okay. And then uh, you might look for the back scattering that is very often done, or you look in the forward scattering, which is done uh, for phase Doppler anemometry, but as well in laser Doppler anemometry, you can do that as well. And by that means, if you use a, a different probe and not using the back scattering, um, using a different probe, you can achieve better spatial resolution. Yeah? Because you can cut out now from this extended cigar-like uh, measurement volume a certain fraction only. And thereby you can maybe can go down to um, two, three hundred microns in the in the bad direction. Okay. What you can do now is you go and uh, determine uh, point statistics like mean velocities, as usual. The only thing which is different is that uh, it is recommended to weight that with the transit time. Have you any idea why? The transit time weighting here. Presume you have a flow consisting of one meter per second and 10 meter per second. And you give yourself a certain measurement time, let's say 60 seconds or something like that. And let's say um, the um, probability of having one meter per second and 10 meter per second would be the same. Then uh, because of the slower velocity, uh, the one meter per second uh, events would be much more seldom uh, during the 60 seconds because it takes much longer factor of 10 longer to pass. And, and for that reason, with the same seeding density assumed, uh, you would have uh, uh, less probability to measure the slow velocity. And because of that, you take the transit time um, as a weighting factor. So meaning if you have a slow velocity, the transit time that is meant how long it takes for a particle to go through your measurement volume, the transit time for a small, uh, for a small velocity, uh, for a slow velocity particle, is longer and thereby it is weighted stronger than a fast particle. And that has to be accounted for, of course, uh, in the weighting that in the denominator you have to uh, divide by it. And this is done um, not only for the mean velocity, but similarly for the velocity fluctuation values. That is, I think, important to notice. In the end, depending on the velocity distribution, it might not make a huge difference, but it has an impact. If you would have this bimodal distribution of velocities just mentioned, then it would have a huge impact. But uh, if you have a smooth distribution, um, uh, it might not be so significant in its uh, impact. Of course, from that you can calculate the turbine kinetic energy. And very often, uh, if you don't measure all velocity components but have a, a symmetry, you might assume that in the two radial directions everything is the same. For complex geometries, of course, this is not true. Uh, and you can calculate the random stresses. That is, as well, I think, quite clear. If you now have measured uh, two velocity components, you can do that uh, by having these two components um, multiplied and averaged, and, of course, uh, as well, transit time weighted. Then um, we come to uh, single point measurements, but having time series now. That is, I think, a real benefit of LDV. What you can do, let's say we restrict ourselves to one component to have the highest data rate possible. And we are looking for the temporal covariance, meaning that um, we, uh, uh, what we do here, uh, we change uh, the delta t. We measure at the same location, delta x is 0. Um, we measure uh, i equals j, meaning, for example, the axial velocity component only. And we change now only the, temp the, the, the temporal separation between two adjacent uh, measurements. And uh, if you do that from 
many millions of uh, samples best, then you can, as already mentioned, you can take the integral of that, you normalize, and you get the integral time scale. And if you Fourier transform that, you get the power spectral density. Uh, an example is shown here. This is a canonical flow. This is an uh, isothermal uh, turbulent jet at the center line, measured uh, at 40 diameters at the center line above the nozzle exit. And uh, measured is the axial velocity component. Uh, and here you see uh, the time. And uh, yeah, it's a very smooth curve uh, because many samples have been taken. If you take here only a few samples, of course, you would have a lot of noise. And it would be maybe good enough for uh, something like an integral t time scale. So if you have less samples, maybe I should draw it in here directly. You might have something like this. And still, the integral would be OK. But then if you would have a noisy curve, you couldn't transform it uh, by Fourier to get the power spectral density as shown here. And uh, well, you see here as well, it's, it's not, not easy to reproduce what it should like that. You would expect something in the power spectral density of minus 5 third uh, decay, but you don't. Well, what is the reason? I'm not sure. Maybe uh, we haven't been exactly at the center line. Uh, it's, it's not so easy if you have a stride uh, pipe uh, to have really the symmetry axis hit. However, it's close to it. I would say um, it is not too bad. Here, you see that noise kicks in. Uh, this end uh, belongs to that one in time. And here, you need really a high discretization in time at this location to resolve the high frequencies in the spectrum. And there is, as well, a certain limit. OK, the limit was here in the order of, let's say, a kilohertz. It's not so impressive, right? It's not so, not so really great. However, that's like it is. Two-point correlations are done in the, uh, in, a, in the following way. You have one fixed probe volume. And now with a second LDV device, you shift your second probe volume that is movable. And for example, in axial direction, but of course you can do it as well in radial direction uh, or in out of plane direction in this view graph. And uh, now delta T is fixed and we change delta X. And by that, you can then obtain the integral length scale. And uh, of course, you can do now as well both. You can shift in time and in space. And uh, in these curves here, are only shown a few, so otherwise it wouldn't be uh, easy to follow. Uh, what's quite nice to see if you have uh, uh, in space delta x zero, then you get here the temporal covariance. If you would restrict yourself to delta t equals zero, then that would be in this plane. Maybe I should make a drawing in here. In this plane, you would have here uh, your projection like this. That is in the for delta t equals zero, and in between, of course. Uh, Many other, others, uh, uh, different separations uh, have been measured as well. But quite interestingly, now coming back, I think you have had a question about Taylor hypothesis. For this easy jet flow, if you now take the mean positions over here, they travel with uh, the mean velocity. And, and that uh, can be used, this space-time correlation, to check whether the Taylor's hypothesis is approved or not. And in this case, it would be. But that is really a costly measurement, because you have to take many, many, many samples. For each separation in delta z, maybe a million or more data points in time from which you then calculate these correlations. It take, it's really it's, it's quite an effort. Zero volume is possible. Pardon me? Uh, correlations yes. Are all, yes, that is possible. That is possible. Because uh, you're, you're looking ideally for uh, delta t equals zero for the same particles in two channels. Yeah, you have two LDV setups, uh, which are looking, they're, they're, they're looking the CW, and you're looking for the same particle. Yes, it, that is possible. OK. Maybe um, some words about particle image velocimetry. This is the alternative technique. Uh, as you will see, it's a very different technique and um, does have its pros and cons. Um, it is nowadays much more popular than LDV, because you measure in a plane. So that's, it's much faster in that sense as well, much cheaper. So the idea is quite simple. Uh, this view graph is taken from La Vision. Um, you take a, not a CW laser, but a pulsed laser. Minimum are two pulses, which are separated by delta T. You create a light sheet, as explained. You split out the light. Uh, 
The thickness of the light sheet is maybe in the order, it shouldn't be too thin, because you might lose particles. Uh, it's in maybe in the order of three, 400 microns, maybe larger. Um, and it intersects your flow, which is again seeded with particles. And then you image um, the me scattering with imaging optics, either at a CCD or a CMOS camera. And um, the CCD and, or CMOS camera uh, takes two images, which are synchronized to these two uh, laser pulses. And by that, you have an uh, um, image from pulse one, image from pulse two. And now you divide your um, field of view into so-called interrogation volumes. And those interrogation volumes are shown here. Uh, in decreasing order, maybe consists of minimum 16 by 16 pixel with a magnification of one. Let it be, to give you an idea, if you have a magnification of one and a CCD camera pixel to make it easy is maybe in the order of 10 micrometers, then uh, 16 by 16 micrometers would be 160 by 160 micrometers. That already would be quite good in uh, the spatial resolution in plane. The out of plane resolution is limited by the thickness of the late light sheet, which is maybe in the order, as I said, of 400 microns. So the out of plane uh, resolution is worse than the in plane resolution. Now you have, uh, as schematically shown over here, two particle images. And the simple idea is identify which particle from pulse number one belongs to the particle measured at pulse number two. If you have that, if you know uh, how they, uh, uh, which one is which, then you can just simply measure the distance in between uh, they have traveled in the time delta t and take then an average velocity over that volume. You do not take it from a single particle, but the recommendation is to have at least something like five to 10 particles in your interrogation volume. And by that, your seeding density is, is restricted. You have to have a minimum seeding density. In LDV, you get data out even if you have a particle per minute. In PIV, you need to have 10 particles at, the, uh, at this uh, small volume at the same time. So uh, that is a huge difference. I've shown that yesterday. That is, again, taken from the engine to give you an idea. The particles should be not uh, too small. If you have a particle image uh, onto one pixel on the camera only, you would end up with troubles. Because what you do in the post-processing is you estimate the particle position with a sub-pixel resolution. And that means the particle has to be distributed over more than one pixel. And if the particle has a size of one micron, of course, you have a certain um, uh, limited optical resolution only. It will be never only then imaged onto a 10 microns pixel. It extends typically over that. If not, you should slightly defocus your lens such that you can reconstruct the position. And then uh, if you have raw images, like this, I would say that's OK, because your eye can follow the movement. If you go back and forth, you would see by eye there would be a tumble motion, right? If you do not see anything by eye, you shouldn't take that data, because a cross-correlation algorithm is never better than your brain um, to get then something this velocities out. Well, here it's shown how it's done with a, a schematically with a CCD frame, uh, uh, our line transfer camera. So um, what you do is uh, you have two exposures. And uh, uh, in between, uh, after these two exposures, you have a readout. Uh, between these two, this would be this delta t uh, synchronized to the lasers. Uh, you have the, the image, without giving details here, stored in a row of pixels uh, which are not illuminated directly in a so-called line transfer camera. That can be done. Maybe some words about the cross-correlation. You have here now, uh, from magnified view of these integration volumes, you see here the particle images. And uh, they need to be correlated now to each other. The way you do it is the following. You take the image pattern from frame number one. You take a, this, let's say, this, this interrogation volume over here. And then you search in the neighborhood for the second image if the particle pattern matches uh, with the first one. And you look for the best match. And you do that by scanning uh, this interrogation volume of the second pulse in space until you find the highest correlation value. Mathematically, that is simply uh, the, the sum over the pixel-wise product of these two images, of these two particle patterns, displaced by a certain value. Okay? 
And then thereby you look for the best match. And uh, that is uh, uh, computationally expensive if you would do it in this domain, in the spatial domain. That's why uh, people do it in the Fourier transform uh, domain, in the Fourier uh, domain, where you have now space coordinates transferred to wave vectors. Because if you now look for the correlation operation, it is simply uh, the, the product. And so that is computationally much faster. And then you end up with a correlation map in the wave uh, number domain, which doesn't tell us too much. You transform it back, the inverse Fourier transform, and back to the spatial domain. And then you would find a correlation map like this. And you find here, uh, for this example, the highest correlation value would be here, displaced from the origin from which you started as frame number one. Uh, that seems to be the most probable um, uh, shift uh, of the particles between these two um, illuminations. And then you just take this distance, you know delta t, and you trace it back to an average velocity uh, vector out of this control volume. And you do that for the whole uh, image, and then you end up maybe with something like that. Everything looks quite nice, but over here, hmm, it looks ugly. Yeah? Here, there seems to be erroneous vectors. And then, uh, if you have a commercial product, you just press a button, and then uh, with a filter operation, you might not exactly know how it's programmed. Uh, afterwards, it's, everything is smooth. Yeah? Because uh, one trick is here to look for the neighborhood to say, that is unphysical. Let's take uh, uh, the neighborhood information to make that smooth, whatever it is. Yeah? But uh, be careful. Without any statement of how many erroneous spurious wrong vectors you started with, you shouldn't trust any PIV. Because maybe everything is just filtered because a commercial product uh, is done in such a way that there shouldn't be uh, the hotline used. And that's clear. That costs money. <laughs> yeah, that's actually, actually, that's what they do. They want to prevent that anyone calls them. And for that reason, uh, those products are, are trained uh, to, be, to give a, a meaningful result. Maybe that's OK for the mean value, but not for the variance. And so if you have more than, I don't know what, 10% erroneous vectors in your, in your uh, processing after the cross-correlation, be careful. You should at least state that. Make a statement about it. You might have good reasons that they can't do it better. Yeah? Then you have to describe it, what you have done to improve the raw data quality. Without that, I wouldn't believe that PIV data, at least not in the variances. Yeah? All right. We have seen that yesterday. You can do that now with high speeds. And uh, I think uh, that is quite useful information you can squeeze out. We have seen that yesterday. I don't have to repeat that. I will just to finish that. What you really can make advantage of this PIV is that you're able to calculate derivatives like that one in different directions from which you, for example, can calculate vorticity. If you have a 2D, 2C, two components measured in a plane, you can measure the, the angular momentum in that sense uh, in that plane, which is called then the out-of-plane uh, vorticity, or the dilatation, how a flow is opening. Um, well, in principle, you can use it as well for uh, space correlation measurements. But that is, of course, limited by the re resolution you have. Because uh, with these interrogation volumes, as I said, maybe you're not better than 100 microns. Uh, maybe with micro PIV, maybe you can do a little better. But um, if you have a high spatial resolution, then your dynamic range is always limited, such that spatial correlation measurements are, mm, yeah, not so trustworthy. In time, nowadays, when you perform PIV at 20, 30 kilohertz, you can do that in principle. Uh, and uh, that is maybe um, uh, much cheaper than doing that with LDV because you get it in the whole field simultaneously, but um, you're limited in the sense that going faster than 20 kilohertz is maybe not required, but you're limited then in the number of samples you can take. Yeah. So uh, in LDV, uh, if you have sufficient time, you can maybe take a million data per point to get a time correlation. Uh, I've never seen that in PIV. So very often PIV is done with only 100 frames. Forget that. You cannot deduce anything from that uh, in terms of uh, time correlations. But the highest number I've seen is in the order of 10,000 or so, and that is maybe even too little to get a smooth curve from which you can uh, obtain the power spectral density at least.
maybe some more words because we haven't had time yesterday. You can extend that um, to volumetric elimination, as I said. Uh, now you eliminate not something which is only a millimeter in its thickness, but maybe four to eight millimeters, and you track the um, particle movement in this volume. It is unfortunately not possible to have a volume maybe 60 by 60 by 60 millimeters, but in the third dimension, the volume is always restricted to only a few millimeters in the applications we are heading for. You need now uh, a bit more laser power, maybe not as much as shown here, uh, but, but much more than a millijoule, I would say. And uh, this was now applied uh, to the engine here in a phase-locked way, meaning that always to the same crank angle degree, the data have been taken because the laser was not, not operable more than 10 hertz. Okay, and the um, volume that is shown over here is, as I said, limited in the third dimension. And then um, uh, the, the volume was observed with four cameras. In principle, two would be sufficient, but having more cameras means that your uh, reconstruction of where the particles actually are is, is more precise. Um, that was done uh, before we have had so-called S CMOS cameras. That was done still with CCD cameras. Nowadays, in new experiments, we have used uh, scientific CMOS cameras, which have much, much more pixels. Yeah? That is an essential to have a good resolution. Uh, uh, modern cameras, these S CMOS cameras, uh, have in the order of, let's say, four to five million pixels instead of in the order of one million pixels. And then um, you have as well a limitation here uh, because of the depth of field. We discussed that previously. Um, you have to aperture down that to 16 to have a sufficient depth of field over this eight millimeters. Yeah, that's a, that's a severe limitation. All right, then as well, like always in PAV, you need a good post-processing. Uh, we are using here the, the product from La Vision, Davis 8. Um, well, many things are done. Subtract the sliding average, uh, normalization, the smoothing, a sharpening filter to get from here to here. Then you do something like a reconstruction where actually are the particles located in that volume. And there are now many, many particles. And uh, we rely here on a reconstruction method uh, from this company. And then uh, you do a volume uh, correlation. The same as I've shown in a plane is now done in a volume. And uh, very important as well, uh, post-processing, where uh, outlier detection is done to remove uh, spurious vectors uh, and as well a certain kind of smoothing. Yeah? A filtering without any clear uh, idea we have on what is the cutoff frequency in space. That is not as well defined. And then you can get very nice information, which is uh, uh, exemplified over here. This is now, I think, a cut which was uh, four or eight millimeters. I think this was eight millimeters cut, uh, where you see during intake the mean velocity. This is the mean tumble plane between the two intake valves. You see that uh, from this perspective or from this perspective, this is the combined jet. The, the flow is going over the valves, and you see here the, the two annular flows combining to one in the middle, uh, which is here creating uh, a reverse flow stagnation plane, and you already see what is happening because of the dominant overflow of this valve, you nicely see how the tumble is created. And that can be done, of course, now in different planes, such that you can as well re reconstruct the volumetric appearance uh, reliably in mean and variances in uh, this engine. Maybe um, it is important to finalize that discussion now here with comparing LDV and PAV, because I think these are really um, some uh, complementary techniques. Complementary in the sense that looking at the seeding density, as I said, PAV needs at least 10 particles or 5 to 10 particles per interrogation volume. And so if you have defined a certain spatial resolution, you have to adapt your seeding accordingly. Or if you want to get a better spatial resolution and have, let's say, uh, your interrogation volume only in both directions halved, yeah, which is then only one quarter, then you need a four times more seeding to have the same amount of seeding per interrogation volume. And so you already see that seems to be not non-intrusive. Yeah, it is. It might be uh, have, a, have uh, an influence. Well, in LDV you have more freedom. Uh, you can 
uh, lower the seeding density as you wish, of course, it, on the expense of more measurement time. Yeah? If you want to have, let's say, at least 10,000 samples per volume, and you have uh, decreased that, then um, uh, this is lowered. But the good thing is the seeding density and the spatial resolution in LDV are decoupled, which is not true for PAV. About the data post-processing and calibration. So PAV always needs a sophisticated cross-correlation algorithm, which means, uh, well, whenever you do digital post-processing of images, that is like a black art. That is not really a science. And that means you have a lot of influence on that. You can manipulate without saying how. And that is a certain danger, as I said. And of course, you need a lot of CPU times. This time is maybe not so important. But more important is you need a proper calibration. And a proper calibration is typically done because you have to transfer the pixel coordinates to millimeters, to spatial coordinates. And this is done by a target. You put in a target, and you take an image of the target. OK. And then you try to make a, make a matching. However, that might be OK for two-component PAV. Starting from stereoscopic PAV, even worse for tomographic PAV, that is not sufficient. So what, uh, what is called in literature that was published, I think, 2007 or so by Wienicke is a so-called self-calibration. If you have an, it, maybe I should make a short drawing. If you have a calibration uh, target like that, uh, that you image, they're typically dots, well-defined. You know exactly where they are. Exactly means maybe 10 microns precision or something like that or better. Um, that is a starting point uh, if you now have two camera images where you have pixels and, and you want to match not only this pixel to this pixel, but as well match it to the physical coordinate. And uh, the self-calibration is working the following way. You take um, an image of the uh, particles, the me scattering image, simultaneously with the same cameras, uh, with, the, with the two cameras, but having the same image. Then you have a particle image of both, which is maybe then looking like this. And then you try, um, if you have then uh, this image of these two cameras, you try to match them as perfect as possible. Yeah? This is a fine adjustment, starting with a calibration target, uh, like that one. You refine it with a pixel, uh, measure it simultaneously in both channels. All right? And this is called self-calibration. And this is necessary for stereoscopic PAV to match the cameras exactly, and even more for tomographic PAV. And without that, I do not know how to do it. And, OK, oh, oops, I wasn't finished yet. So this is different in LDV, because here uh, you can uh, have not only a, a online data post-processing, uh, you do not need any calibration. Because uh, what you get from, from uh, if, you, if you purchase such a system, a well-aligned uh, 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 sending optics where the calibration is not required. If you want to have most reliable point data, still, I would refer uh, LDV is superior to uh, PIV. However, it takes a lot of time. So it's costly. And in some times where you have, let's say, fogging of your optical excess, it's maybe not even possible. And for uh, that is much better in PAV, where you instantaneously, even at high speed, get your velocimetry data. And as well, you can uh, determine or estimate at least gradients, uh, which is not so easy in LDV, because then you would need uh, always two-point LDV, which is uh, hardly done. And so for me, LDV and PAV are complementary techniques, uh, and it really depends on the question you ask, which one is better suited. OK? So far, the first session for this morning. Thank you for your attention. And we meet then again at 11 o'clock, I think. Thanks. <laughs>